Hey there and welcome to this video. In the following I'll be doing a paper explanation about cross attention. If you haven't heard about cross attention, don't be discouraged because it's the technique that makes so many deep learning models perform so well and enable so many impressive results. You definitely have heard about stable diffusion, image gen or muse. They all use cross attention. And for what? Cross attention is a way to condition a model with some extra information. The aforementioned models all use it to condition their models on text. And as of now, cross attention seems to be the best method for injecting text conditioning into a model. And not only that, this also enables so many cool follow up techniques as you might have seen with stable diffusion. And my intention with this video is to give you some intuitive and visual explanation about cross attention. Because I believe while many people have heard about it a lot, especially through the hype of stable diffusion, many don't really understand how it works and just treat it as a black box. And the same was true for me before I started making this video. So let's not lose any time and get into the explanation. So before going into cross attention itself, I want to take some time to talk about the standard attention, also called self attention. You probably have all seen this formula over and over. We have some input and construct three different matrices called Q, K and V. Then we multiply Q by K and divide by a constant and then take a softmax and after that we multiply by V. Voila, attention. But what does it actually do? For that I want to take an example about how to use self attention on an image. This is also done by stable diffusion for example. But note that this doesn't have anything to do with conditioning the model on some extra information. Self attention is a way to globally route information between the entire image instead of just locally as with convolutions. You will see what that means in a second. For simplicity let's say our image has only 2 by 2 pixels, but let's also assume the image is RGB and thus has 3 channels. To apply self attention now, we first have to flatten our image like this, which gives us a shape of 4 by 3. And remember it's just 4 pixels with 3 channels for RGB. Now we want to get our Q, K and V matrices, which means we need three different weights to project our input pixels into the latent space where we'll apply attention. In order to make things really simple and easy to visualize, I'm choosing to project the three dimensional input into two dimensions, but in practice you would go much higher. In order to do that, each weight matrix will have a shape of 3 by 2. Remember that to project some vector from a dimension of n into a dimension of m, you construct a matrix of shape n times m. In our case we want to go from three dimensions to two dimensions, which is why we construct the 3 by 2 matrix. Easy, right? First let's make up some arbitrary values for our image pixels which we can calculate with. Projecting the input to Q, K and V leaves us with all matrices of the shape of 4 by 2. Now let's take a look at the first step which is to calculate Q by K. This operation basically multiplies each vector in Q which stands for one pixel by all other vectors of the pixel in K. Since each of these is a dot product, the outcome will be a single number indicating the similarity between the vectors. And by doing this for all pixels, we get a similarity matrix of each pixel to every other pixel. So multiplying Q by K can be interpreted as a similarity measurement. We can better see this if we visualize Q and K in a two dimensional grid. If the model thinks that two pixels should attend to each other or in other words should share some information, it can use the weight matrices for Q and K to project them close together as done with these two vectors for example. By applying the dot product between the two we get a high number for the similarity. Whereas for example these two vectors are further away from each other and thus the similarity will be small and they will not attend to each other as much. Now in the formula you see that we divide by this factor, but for demonstration purposes I will omit it since it only scales the similarity matrix. This is mainly done for having a more stable training. Next we apply the softmax function. In our case we apply it over the rows because we want to normalize the values for how much one individual pixel it tends to all others. You can interpret these values now as to how much a pixel will attend to some other pixel. For example this pixel here will attend 23% to itself, 33% to the second pixel, 27% to the third and another 17% to the fourth pixel. 
And here you can already see how attention enables us to route information between all pixels in a single layer. And the last step is now to multiply our similarity matrix by the V matrix. And here you'll see that this basically just acts as a weighted average. You can see that best if instead of doing the normal matrix multiplication, we take each row in the similarity matrix and multiply each value by the corresponding row embedding for each pixel in V. Let's look at the first row of our similarity matrix. We take the first value, which stands for how much the first pixel should attend to the first pixel, in that case 0.23 or 23%, and multiply it by the first row of the V matrix. Then we take the second value, 0.33 or 33%, which stands for how much the first pixel should attend to the second pixel, and multiply it by the second row. And we do the same for the third and fourth value. And at the end, we sum up all vectors. And you can see it's the same outcome as with the normal matrix multiplication. Just a bit better to understand in my opinion. And that's how we do it for every row of the similarity matrix. We end up having a 4 by 2 matrix, where each row is a weighted average of the embeddings of all pixels. And I really want to emphasize the last point. We started off with each pixel having its own embedding solely influenced by itself. And we end up with a mix of all pixel embeddings and this mix and its proportions can be determined by the model itself. It's like you being a cook and you can determine how you want to mix ingredients together to get the best possible outcome in the form of a meal. And that was the core idea of how attention works in the form of self-attention. Pretty easy and intuitive, right? The last thing that we still have to do is to project the 4 by 2 matrix back into the original space which had 3 dimensions for RGB. And we do that with a simple linear layer of shape 2 by 3. And now at the end we add the attention output to the input. The reason we do the skip connection with the input is not only because the gradients can flow better, but it's also because of the fact that the attention can fully concentrate to attend to whatever it wants. Without the skip connection, each pixel would also need to pay a lot of attention to itself in order not to lose information about itself. With the skip connection, the original input stays fully preserved and can be modified by the attention output in whatever way the model thinks it's useful. I hope it makes sense, if not just ask in the comments and we can think of a nice example to explain it. Okay, now with that knowledge in mind, understanding cross-attention will be super easy. In cross-attention we do one significant change to the Q, K and V. Instead of all matrices being projections of the input features, in our case the images, only Q will be a projection of the input features and K and V will be projections of the conditional information. In the example that we'll be doing, we'll assume the condition will be text, but basically anything else would work too. Let's first talk about how text is represented usually. Right now most text to image models employ some large pre-trained transformers and usually they only use the encoder. The first step is to take your caption and tokenize it. Then each token will be embedded and fed through the transformer layers of the encoder and eventually we'll get an output with a shape that sort of looks like this. The first number is just the batch size, the second number is the number of tokens and the third is the encoding dimension after all transformer layers. In our simple example we'll ignore the batch size and take as an example I love mountains, which I do. And let's say that we tokenize it and apply the transformer and get as output the matrix of shape 3 by 6. Three tokens, I love mountains, which all have an embedding of 6. And now let's construct all weight matrices. We again will project into a two-dimensional space. And we said that this time only Q comes from the image and K and V from the conditioning. For our 4x4 image, we'll take the same projection of 3 by 2 And for K and V, we'll create projections of 6 by 2 to project the six-dimensional embeddings down to 2. So now we have Q, which has a shape of 4x2 and K and V, which have a shape of 3 by 2 4 pixels and 3 words. And now we do the exact same thing as before. We first multiply Q by K. And to look at it in more detail, every embedding of each pixel will be multiplied by each embedding of each word. So embeddings which are similar will have a high value and therefore a given pixel will attend more to a specific word. In our example, the pixels containing the mountains might pay a lot of attention to the word mountain. After creating the similarity matrix now, we again normalize the values with the softmax. The final step is to multiply the similarity matrix by the value matrix. 
and we can apply the same trick as before here to understand better what's going on. Let's focus on the first row for the first pixel. This pixel wants to attend 47% to the first word, 22% to the second word and 31% to the last word. And that's why we multiply the first row of the value matrix, which remember comes from the text conditioning, by 0.47, then add the second row times 0.22, and then add the third row times 0.31 to it. This will make up the weighted embedding vector of all words for the first pixel. And now we do the same for the rest of the pixels and all the words. And by the end, each pixel will have acquired information of the entire text conditioning and decided for itself what it wants to pay attention to the most. Beautiful, right? And now we have the final projection layer, which goes back to the original space of three dimensions for RGB. Since we are at a two dimensional space, we will again construct this projection layer to have a weight shape of two by three. Inputting the attention output of shape 4x2 transforms it into 4x3 and we can happily add it back to our input with the skip connection. And there you have it, that is cross attention. And the cool thing is that you can use cross attention for so many other things as also shown by stable diffusion. You just need to find a good way to bring your conditional data into a not too big dimensional space such that the computations don't explode and you're good to go. To conclude this video, let's do a quick summarization. In self-attention, we create three different projections from our inputs, Q, K and V. The goal of attention is to enable our model to route information together in a global manner of what it thinks is useful. We first multiply Q by K, which serves as a similarity lookup and gives us a measurement how much each element wants to attend to every other element. After normalizing the output, we then multiply the similarity matrix by V to route the essential information together. We apply a final linear layer to project back into the original space and add the skip connection to modify the input in a useful way. And the same logic applies to cross attention where now K and V come from a conditional input. We create our projection matrices to embed Q, K and V into the same space and do the same as before. This time each element from our main input has the possibility to attend to each element from the conditional input in any way. So you see it's really about giving our model the most possible freedom and avoid human handcrafted features and hard coded rules. This to me seems to be one of the biggest lessons of the past of deep learning and I guess it's really valuable to keep in mind when tackling new problems. I hope most of the things were clear but if anything was unclear just feel free to post it in the comments. And if you like this kind of content, consider subscribing and sharing it to a friend. And with that being said, I wish you a nice day.